um, make it uh, in the ways that we're used to. So I'm um, very uh, glad to, to keep going in a way, to keep iterating, to keep kind of changing this form. Um, and so I, uh, so um, one, there are a ton of interviews that I've asked um, several friends and colleagues of mine to, to join me for. So we're gonna hear from directors. We're gonna hear from Evren Ajikin. We're gonna hear from, let's see, Martin K. Green, who's a dramaturg, president of the Literary Managers and Dramaturg Association of America. We're gonna hear um, from Incredible Deep Tran, who is a theater journalist and theater critic. Um, so we're, I'm gonna do interviews with as many people as I can find and bring into this space to share with you how theater is actually made. How does a director of new plays work with a playwright? How does a dramaturg work with a playwright? Um, what is the relationship between theater journalist and theater critic and writer and theater maker and our, you know, so I'm just gonna keep populating this space with a lot of interviews. Um, and uh, I, I missed that when I was in grad school. Um, I didn't get uh, necessarily the, 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 the community aspect um, of theater makers all over the, the country. So I'm really thrilled to do that. And I hope you, I think you'll learn a ton um, and I get to spend some time with fun people. So there's already a couple of interviews um, that you can watch now with my co-writer, Margaret Melcon. She and I wrote Miss Bennett and the Wickhams and the incredible actor and acting teacher, Reggie D. White. Um, so there'll be a bunch more of those. So I, I hope you enjoy those. Um, I think they'll give you a, a ton to, to think about. Um, we're also going to be doing a new book club because I don't know why. <laughs> um, so this time next Wednesday and the Wednesday after, we're gonna be discussing a couple books um, on writing that I found really useful. The first one next week will be Backwards and Forwards by David Ball. Um, if you can order this, do. Uh, it's unfortunately not available on like a Kindle or digital, but there are a few chapters that if you Google this book, Backwards and Forwards by David Ball, you can see a couple chapters for free that are scanned in Google's book repository. So that, that'll give you a great place to start. And even if you don't have the book, I think you'll learn a lot. The next week we'll do this book, John York's Into the Woods, which is a lot about screen and TV and stuff, but it blew my mind um, in how he talks about specifically dramatic structure, dialogue and character. And just, um, I think there's a lot here that'll, that'll get you thinking. Um, um, but I wanted to start today uh, a couple of ways. One, um, I will I will shortly rant about a thing that I've been thinking a lot about, about streaming theater um, and the responses to it and the proliferation of it. Um, the short version is I think it's awesome and I think it should continue, but I will rant on that for a moment. The, the, the thing I wanted to start with is like many of us, even very seasoned writers that I've been excited to talk to, there's a new podcast coming from the Playwrights Foundation, which is located here in the Bay Area which will be um, conversations with writers and kind of what they're like right now. What's, what is it like to be a writer right now? What's it like um, kind of internally and externally as a creative, but as a singular person anyway. But in that context, I was talking to people and see these incredible writers and we're all a bit messed up and mixed up. And some days I feel very organized and structured and certainly proud of what I do. And some days I'm just, I don't know what's going on. I don't know how to do what I used to do. I don't know. I don't know how to be an artist. I don't know how to be a writer in this time. Um, both of those forms, any form that your reality takes right now is fine. I mainly hope that we're all safe. I hope that people's lives and livelihoods are protected. And after this, we can all kind of see a new normal on the, on the side and um, do the grieving we need to do and be there for each other. Um, but however you are in this time is, um, is how you should be. Uh, I'm telling you that because I need to hear that. <laughs> um, and I also say that there is profound work being done for those of you who are artists, which I think all of you are, in just witnessing, in witnessing this moment and being aware of this moment in unpacking it as you choose to and just hearing each other and being there for each other. Um, that is the work of an artist too and a, and a, and a writer. So do that work as well. And if that's all you do is just go, man, this is freaking weird. <laughs> that is fine <laughs> and helpful. And who knows what that will become um, in the long run. And it may not become anything and that's fine too. So, um, all right, 
So let's start with our rant. Well, here's what we're going to do after the rant. Rant, we're going to talk about streaming theater. Um, and then we're going to talk about um, comedy writing uh, because there is, it is a thing, a specific thing. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time on kind of how I do it, which would be very different than say how David Lindsay Abair or Peter Nachtrieb or all of these amazing comedy theater writers do. Um, but I think there is some there's some similarity that I think we can we can talk about. Um, we're also going to talk about writing specifically for younger audiences or family shows, that what we call TYA theater for young audiences. I don't know a ton about theater for the very young, which is a whole different um, uh, art form, which is thankfully very alive now. Maybe I can get somebody who's a specialist in that um, to join me and talk to you about that. But that's for by very young, it means as young as six months old. What is theater for a six month old? Um, I would like to know more. So maybe we can, I'll try to find somebody to chat with us about that. But anyway, so we're gonna talk about writing for theater for young audiences. Um, we are going to talk about, what else did I was gonna talk about? Yes, um, kind of the process of a new play, the business of playwriting. I can ch chat, share with you what I know about working with publishers and agents and all that kind of stuff. Um, and one thing that I really uh, want to spend some time on is the question of should I write this play um, and that conversation about cultural appropriation working with cultural consultants. Is this the story that you get to tell is it you know that those kind of questions um, and mainly I don't have a ton of answers but I want to make open the space for that to be a part of how you consider writing because it's a very important one now. Okay, so let's start start with our rant. Um, I am sure as you have known we're seeing a lot of streaming and theater. Um, and I think it's great. I think, is it the same thing as seeing theater live? Of course not, absolutely not. Should it be the same thing? No, what if we don't try to make it the same thing? What if it is a new thing? It is a distinctive thing and it's not trying to replace theater. It is not trying to be theater in the way that we know it as the congregationality and the convergence and the collectivity that I so miss. I'm so thirsty for that coming together. Nothing replaces that. I cannot wait to go see a play and stand up and applaud with hundreds of people at the end. But I feel like we are um, in immediately doubting and jumping to to judge it and to say, well, ugh, this is ridiculous. Uh, the theaters doesn't belong on a screen. Some theater can work beautifully on a screen and some not. And if you don't want it to be the same thing, I think that it can do an it can be an incredible gift and an equalizer in this art form, which as much as I love it, can be elitist. It can cost money, it takes time and space, it, um, it takes getting to places, it is regional and that stuff makes it, it many, that is the core of what makes it beautiful um, in terms of that, the democracy of congregation that we get to come together, all of us and experience this thing together. You can sit next to anybody, but at the same times, if you can pay $10 to stream a play, um, I would say she should do it. I would say if you can't pay $80 to see you, to go and see a play, if you can't pay the money to get there or the childcare to go see that show, um, the, the jobs that you may have to cancel or pause to go see, to be someplace at a certain time, I'd say, why not? Let's stream it. If we can get our unions behind this and understand the gift that this is, I'm like a lot of you watching plays at the Globe in London right now. I'm watching the National Theater in London. I'm watching shows in, Chicago and Minneapolis um, and in New York and DC. I mean, there's so much going on and I don't get to go see those plays all the time. And, you know, if, if a person can't pay $80 to go see the show, they probably certainly can't pay $300 to sit in the best seats closest to the actors, which is what those streaming shows give us. I get right next to see the, the wonderful musical Tony Stone at ACT or the beautiful production of Gloria also at ACT, Berkeley Reps shows. Uh, my world is Bay Area, so a lot of these coming from that. Marin Theater did a beautiful um, recording of the, a world premiere show. That world premiere could have like zapped away, but we have this recording and I get to go and see it and I get right up next to these actors in a way that you don't always get in normal theater experience. This is not a bad thing. This is a great thing. Is it a different thing? Yes. The other thing that makes me think of is like, this isn't a strange thing to televise something that is best experienced live. Like, you know, all of sports, <laughs> obviously going to see like Steph Curry front row on the court of a Warriors game is like the coolest, but am I going to watch it on TV? Yes, I will. 
this is not strange, this whole like, wow, taking a live event and putting it on a streamed pl platform to see at your leisure. I don't understand why this is so baffling. Um, and I do think it does so much good, um, not just at this time when of course we cannot be together, we can't do it. So to shame or demean any attempt to put more out art in the world, to put more connectivity in the world, um, to say, I don't know, if we had months or years to plan this, this it may look a little bit different, but we didn't. The fact that we acted this quickly is incredible. Bravo us. Thank you to all of these theaters that pivoted so quickly. Thank you to the union for going, you know what? Okay, ah, just go, do it, yes. Thank you, I just, I, I find it amazing. Will it last? Can it last? I hope so. In some version, I would love to be able to be subscribers of theaters across the world and be able to stream their shows. And does every show need to be streamed? Probably not. Every theater? Probably not. We're making this up. But I think to, to say this is a just for now thing and a just for this crazy time thing, I, I think that is visionless. Uh, I think theater has a lot of work to be done to equalize in its own terms, to make it as democratic and open and welcoming as it can possibly be in our bricks and mortar way. But can, should we turn our back on this form? Absolutely not. Should we question it, interrogate it, make sure it works for everybody? Absolutely. Um, but the idea that, that it is this strange and foreign thing um, seems, seems a little conservative in terms of the vision that I expect theater people to have. Now, I want to, again, interrogate it and make sure it serves people and doesn't take advantage of folks. But thank God for these people <laughs> putting music out there, putting Shakespeare's speeches, reading sonnets, doing scenes. And you know what? If you don't like it, if it doesn't feel right to you, just don't stream it. It's fine. Let us play. Let us have our art. Put more art in the world. Yes, please. Oh my God. Don't be like, well, it's not perfect. Yeah, life is not perfect right now. I would like to leave my house. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Anyway, um, I could obviously rant on this. I'm look, looking forward to conversations about this, but man, do I hope that we can take a lesson for this and see the gift that it is to share art in all the forms that we can get it. Um, knowing how ready I am to get back to its original form. This is an old art form and the reason it, it is old and is still here and is not going anywhere is because it iterates and it pivots and it grows and it adds. So let's, let's let it do that um, now and forevermore. All right, rant over. <laughs> okay, we're gonna talk about comedy. Um, here are my notes on comedy. Um, okay, so I, the basis of all good theater, but certainly comedy, is actually not the one-liners, not the witticism, not the wordplay. It's all based in character. Um, and that means that the more we know a person, we can spot their inconsistencies. We can spot their loves and hates. We can imbue them and understand their opinion and already build the tension required for a good comic moment. Comedy happens with tension, tension, break, tension, tension, break. You can build tension a lot of ways in terms of, let's say repetition is an obvious one, this rule of three, right? That the rule, a pattern creates tension because we now, if there is a pattern, we want to keep that pattern going, which creates tension. Um, and when you break the pattern on the third or fourth time, uh, that bursts the tension and we have this new normal set to do that again. You can do that with character. Um, the pattern of a character. Well, we know they hate broccoli, hate broccoli, hate broccoli. Of course, when the broccoli comes right down on the plate, although not a very good joke, we will all go, <laughs> right? Because we know what a plate of broccoli on its own does not make us chortle, but a plate of broccoli in front of a character we know has <laughs> aversion to it. It's Indiana Jones and the snakes, right? As soon as he drops in that thing and he sees the snakes, we're already like, oh man, oh Indy. You're gonna hate this, right? So it's about knowing and communing and understanding. So play into that. Again, this is all, in some ways, play, all of playwriting notes are the same note, um, but certainly with comedy, the more specific and consistent your character is, then when they do reverse or are put in front of a thing that we already know about them, will drive them crazy or make them fall in love or et cetera, um, then, we get the pleasure of knowing and not being told. That's a good thing. We can experience it not being and not have it be told to us. Because one thing that just ruins comedy is, as we know, explaining the joke. Um, uh, so that encourages us to 
as um, our dear Polonius says, uh, brevity being the soul of wit, brevity, brevity, brevity. So again, if we have to explain a joke or set up a joke that takes forever, the soul of wit is shriveling <laughs> in our midst. Um, but being using all the tools of character, character building and clippy dialogue and pace, um, we can have the soul of wit uh, be alive and well because we are being brief, we are being efficient, we are being swift and smart. Um, so one, uh, one other thing to add to character um, is of course comedy comes from opinion. Uh, your characters need to have strong opinions, strong passions, that thing my grandmother told me about interesting people or people with interests. Uh, that is true with opinion as well. If you have an interest, you have an opinion about that thing. So it can be very funny for people of opposing opinions, of course, to be in the same conversation in the same space, even more funny if they're trying to work together. So adding opinion, using that opinion, testing that opinion is where a lot of the, um, that integral and intimate comedy comes from. Again, it's not about a pratfall. It's about knowing, oh my God, I know that this character hates that. And of course, you know, here, here comes the character displaying that thing and they, we get to exercise that hatred humorously. Um, so there is also a, um, a comedy strategy in strategic repetition. This is a little bit of that rule of threes thing. Um, but if you again, talk about uh, um, using something you've planted earlier at a strategic moment later. Now again, too much repetition is obvious. The audience is gonna be ahead of you. We don't want that. But strategic repetition is a good use of, of um, a good exercise of comedy. Plant something earlier, use it later. That's basically it. <laughs> and this could be a phrase, a, uh, an entrance pattern, a physicality, a um, symbol, gesture, whatever. Um, but using it um, over, uh, you know, again, strategically uh, can be, can have great power. And again, do the, the brief work of not having to explain a thing. If we've already seen it once before, we don't have to explain it again. So brevity, soul of wit, just listen to Hamlet as always. Um, contrast is funny, bringing characters of differing, as I mentioned, differing opinions, different lifestyles, different, um, you know, all, all of that, you can put them right next to each other and Locking them in a room together, we, we will see um, a version of comedy or um, barbarism ensue. <laughs> um, surprise is funny, reversal is funny. So building these things in, I've told you these before, certainly about uh, surprise, secrets, all of that. Um, but there is, the secret itself might, be a, might not be, uh, have a comic heart to it, but the reaction, the opinion of the people around experiencing that secret is where we get to go, oh no, the secret came out and I already know that character one and character two are going to be miserable about it and character three and character four are going to be elated. Now we can all go, oh, what's going to happen? Right. So tension continued, reversal, contrast, surprise. Um, reversal of opinion can be a great source of comedy as well. This is again, all about changing, plot is change. How does a character grow? How does the world change from beginning of a play to an end? All things we've discussed before, but on the micro level, that can be great. Um, and I, I will say the general comic principle and one important for those of you as you're writing, think about how fast comedy has to go. Comedy is not slow. It is fast. And that means reversals can be a fast. A changing of opinions can be a fast. Um, surprises can be fast. Come and go, come and go. Things move rapidly now. Um, and comedy necessitates that uh, because of that tension. Again, slow can have a certain tension. Drama and tragedy and horror are slow tension. Comedy is fast tension. So, so do with that what you will. You can try to prove me wrong, but I will say every single play I've ever given, except for one, and I'll tell you which one, um, the note has always been faster, funnier, because the drama can usually take care of itself with great actors, good direction. You can make space for the drama, for those soulful moments, for the the weeps or the rages. They can they are more obvious and less technical. Now, to be inside an actor's body as they are doing that, very technical, athletic, profoundly um, brilliant. You have to be to do that. But comedy is so technical, the execution of it. 
um, that the writing has to help that. So help with speed, go, go, go. Making characters turn on a dime in their opinion. Talk this way, then talk that way. Um, entrance, exits, moving in this, in this rapidity will help that comedy flow, flow, flow. And if it's not working, if it's not funny, I swear to God, just tell the actors to go faster. <laughs> I love actors so much. Um, and I know I'm deeply annoying every time that I show up at a preview and are like, this was amazing, you're fabulous, go faster. It was amazing, you're fabulous, go faster. You're not fast enough, a little bit faster. <laughs> um, uh, and I think that Reggie D. White and I talked a little bit about this in the interview with him about the kind of actors that I love working with are the ones that know that they can take that technical note of going fast and also know that they have room to have full characters, full range of their voice and emotion and bring all of the talent uh, that they have, but also do that, execute the things technically. So comedy is the one thing. I will always work with a comic actor, even if the play is dead serious, because the capacity of great comedians to know how to um, work with text and uh, take those technical, um, uh, notes and give us something clear and fast and funny and full. Um, I, I find unparalleled in, in great comics. So, so that's a tiny bit about comedy. Um, the big note for writers, of course, is say it out loud, hear it out loud, get, get somebody to read it out loud because you really don't know um, how funny it is and or how funny you can make it if you can't hear it. So you know, make yourself read it out loud, hear it out loud, get people around you to read it for you um, and know that it is supposed to be out loud. So this comedy is one of those things that it's very rarely the information that is funny. It's the delivery. It's the line next to this line. It's the reversal, the surprise, the interruption, the one, two, three, that is funny. It's, it's more circumstantial um, and less informationally that is funny. That's not always true. You can say a funny thing, but um, giving that pace and rhythm of writing is gonna be really important in comedy. I find it to be such. All right, moving right on to um, Theater for Young Audiences. Again, we call it TYA for short. Um, theater for Young Audiences. I started my career in Theater for Young Audiences. I love writing Theater for Young Audiences and I wrote it before I had kids. Um, and I think I learned a bunch <laughs> uh, reading it now, now that I have kids and going back and be like, yeah, that was, a, that was an interesting choice for children. Um, but I've worked with um, some incredible companies, incredible artists, and I wanted to put these together, a conversation about comedy and a conversation about TYA because they speak to each other. Um, the thing you're gonna run up against with kids is they are very honest audience members. They will tell you immediately when they're bored, um, if it is not interesting. Uh, and so you have to surf that and know that ahead of time uh, so that you can give them something that is a lean forward uh, experience for them. Uh, and a lot of it is, once again, faster, funnier. Um, now it's not always a comedy. Uh, kids don't necessarily always have to be laughing. Um, they can totally uh, comprehend and understand great depth of emotion and real issues. It's not just about, you know, who stole my popsicle or whatever. Um, it can be about justice and um, family and love and death, good things, hard things, big things. Kids are totally capable of going for that. And I think that's great children's theater is writing for that um, uh, wisdom, the, a, a childhood wisdom. Um, I will also say that I think of it as writing a normal show. I write the show to make me laugh um, as well as them. Now, I, I will certainly put like a stinky foot joke in there, <laughs> um, absolutely. Um, and, you know, every now and then like a poop joke because man, kids love a poop joke. <laughs> um, but it's really like a normal show. And I think the most successful versions of theater for audiences is treating, uh, giving them respect, um, treating them like mature, mature audience members because they are, um, they have their own sophistication. I, the notes that I will give though, so okay, if, it's an, if it's a normal show, we need a clear beginning. We need a, that midpoint where something changes and things get real big. Um, but we need to talk about midpoints again too. Um, and we need an ending where the character defines who they are. The journey has been completed. We, we know what this character uh, has been pushed to, to declare about themselves and what they feel about it. All of that normal playwriting, right? Um, specifically, 
children's shows, family shows are usually under an hour or about an hour. Um, so you got to go quick. Uh, that may mean that you're not going to have room for a ton of subplots, a ton of characters, um, but it, it all it all works out because we want to get to the fun really fast. Um, I would say don't dawdle, don't have a lot of long speeches. Peop, uh, characters need to be very clear in what they want and why this is important now. Those two things, once those are clear, audiences click in and kids need to buy in really early. Now, I've written both plays that are not musicals uh, for kids and musicals for kids. And I find that both um, require uh, a couple of things, clarity and brevity, both of which we've somewhat discussed in, in, in comedy as well. Um, brevity is going to just make that thing speed along because as if any of you who have kids or know them, know that attention wanes very quickly. So the more next, 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 next um, that you can put in your show, the better for kids. Um, and honestly for adults too, but, but certainly for kids. Um, I will also say there's this wonderful thing and it's a bit of magic that I experienced in some of my first uh, children's uh, shows and it is the absolute and singular power of two things. One, somebody leaning forward and saying, I'm gonna tell you a story. Suddenly all eyes go open and breath hushes and we listen. Now, how long we listen and how attentively is up to you. How fast can we put facts, clarity of character, clarity of goal, um, uh, what they're up against, how they're gonna go for it. Let's not wait to go for it, we're going for it now. That's how you, once you say that, once those lights up and sometimes you can actually have a character come out and say, I'm gonna tell you, sir. Um, even better, I have a secret and I'll tell you. Those are lean forward moments. And I, you can actually do this in, in theater for young audiences um, even more kind of gracefully <laughs> than you can in, in adult theater. Um, so, but take that power in. The idea that you can say, and me, whatever that magic is for you, that, that is truly the, the simplest magic of theater is I'm gonna tell you a story, you're gonna love it. <laughs> Guess what happens next? Guess what happens next? Kids need that um, to, to buy in. Um, and the other thing is when they sing. <laughs> as soon as somebody starts singing, kids stop talking, focus in, kind of cannot wait for the magic of music and song um, to, to transport them. They will buy in. Um, so part of why such uh, great theater for young audiences is musicals is because of that, because it helps go right to the point. It's also instantly emotional. So it's very good for kids to know what do they feel? Um, are they okay? What's wrong? What are they worried about? What do they love? You know, you can use music to just zap you right in and it, it really helps get kids all in the same emotional space um, and on the journey really quickly. Um, I will say uh, audience interaction is one that kids both love. Also, I will caution you to use it sparingly because in a live performance, man, can that get out of hand? I've had some fabulous times when the audience is invited uh, in, in the show and it's also very hard to get them to like, okay, you're just going to listen quietly now. I know I asked you to like run around like crazy people. Now you have to, <laughs> to zoom back in <laughs> um, and listen. So use it at distinctive times, um, but I would say don't make the whole show that, at least in my opinion, I will not do that because it's, it's too, uh, it can be too distracting. And there's always the one show off kid. Many of us watching may have been that show off kid <laughs> who will take it and run with it and then try to take it over the show and blah, blah, blah. But um, <laughs> even a really big punchline can let kids get out of control. So I would say the more that you workshop your theater bring on it to show and do it in front of kids, you'll be able to spot those lines coming and can build something in after that as a kind of, even a character coming on and be like, oh, all right, all right, all right, you know, or start a song right after that so that the audience can be swept up and have someone enter, have something happen uh, so that you're not sitting there with your poor characters trying to, to get that attention back. Um, yes, so again, kids can handle big ideas. My colleagues, Kate and Brian, um, who uh, we'll be speaking to on Friday for our musical theater class. <laughs> so excited, it'll be right here. Um, they, she, they and uh, um, we all wrote a, uh, a musical 
um, at the Kennedy Center about the moon landing. It's about physics and kids and, you know, it's the 60s in America and so it's also about being a, a young black girl and looking at these white male astronauts and thinking, could I be one of those? And so you can write big, big stuff. That was directed by Don Monique Williams. She did such an incredible job. Um, and I reminded me the power um, of uh, theater for young audiences, partly because it's not just for young audiences. It's for parents, it's for grandparents. It's, for, it's a multi-generational theater experience. And if you think of it like that, and that it is a real ass play, um, then you can, uh, I think, make the most of it. Um, and it's, it's, it's so gratifying. I, I love nothing more than the memory of bringing my boys to see the show that we wrote and they just flipped. They were singing the songs. They still sing the songs all the time. So it's such a worthwhile thing. And I also think of theater for audiences as building the future of theater. If you can make a really rad, emotional, exciting, well-crafted, if you just give kids great art, they will come to want it and need it and expect it and seek it out at every stage of their life. And that certainly is, is a good day's work. So I, I, it's also a great way to get started, kind of much like we were talking about adaptations or history plays as being a real way to kind of um, sink in. Oops, sorry, just knocking stuff over. Um, get your career, kind of uh, catalyze that career, get started, um, show what you can do. Children's Theaters is, is a great way to do that. Um, there's a lot of, of people uh, seeking it out. And um, uh, yeah, and there's, there's the door is a little bit more open for new writers in that capacity. I think it always has been. Um, so anyway, think about that. Uh, yeah, great. All right. So we've talked about theater for young audiences. We've ranted. <laughs> we've talked about comedy. Um, I'm going to spend a tiny bit of time. What was I going to talk about? Oh yeah, uh, for a brief second talking about midpoints because I've talked about midpoints a lot in terms of adding danger and strangeness and upset to a character midway through. Remember we have our beginning, the midpoint right in the middle of the show is when that character is going to be tested greatly. Some massive obstacle is put in their way. Something changes enormously for that character. And I've talked about it in, in negative terms but midpoints don't have to all be negative. Um, and this is what I'm gonna get to in a second about um, emotion tracking emotionality, kind of emotional outline, because the midpoint can be, depending on the ending of your play and how you're earning it, can be a great thing. It can be they get a version of what they want. They get the first news that the person loves them back. They get a big success, a discovery, something that that still change paradigm shift, right? As long as there's a big paradigm shift at the end, depending on what your play ultimately is going to be about. Um, that midpoint doesn't have to be dun, 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 bad news. It can also be like, holy shit, what? Yay! You know. Um, so anyway, just just putting that putting that out there. Um, so part of what this leads me into is this conversation about ups and downs. Um, and there are two versions of this that conversations I've had in my career. One from a professor and one from a very famous screenwriter. Um, and both of them tell me the same thing, which is. Thinking about um, the ups and downs, there's a jaggedness to the emotional journey of your character. So if you have, basically, if you have three awesome things happen in a row, five awesome things, just the full first act is nothing but awesome things, that is, gives your character nothing to do no range. And we need to watch the character go, good news, bad news, good news, bad news. I'm loving this. Oh, this is hard. Oh, this is great. Oh, this is different. Okay. Um, I'm in the medium. Oh, no, that's bad. Oh, wait, we're back at good. That is what we literally refer to colloquially as the roller coaster, right? It's a roller coaster, this show, this TV show, this play. Um, so think of it as such. We need those ups and downs um, to get uh, the contrasting feeling that makes a character rich and interesting to get that, um, you know, that kind of the, the extra speed and acceleration that you get going around a corner um, physically, that's emotionally what you get if we go from highs to lows, good news to bad news. Um, so think about that. If your character, if the plot of your play has like lots of good news in a row or lots of bad news in a row, it's like the bad play, the bad news play, the good news play, it has to be this. We have to go up and down. Um, and so one way to think about structuring your play or interrogating the outline that you've had or your, your play is, is to track that. How many good things happen um, without a bad thing? How many bad things happen without some glimmer of, of hope? And if you're, if there's a lot, if it's the, the train of despair, 
then try to upset that, um, adjust that, uh, iterate on in that space to figure out how you can have some range. Um, this, you know, we don't really write full on tragedies right now. <laughs> Everything is hard and good and comedies aren't just solidly comic. The, you know, it, it, the Greeks had that separation and that, that doesn't really exist now because let, I think we're more, we have a more complex sense of what theater storytelling wants. And good news and bad news can come right next to each other. Happiness and tragedy can be right on the heels of each other. Um, and I think plays that that really um, speak to that and give your character places to go. And that's really what it's about. Give your character something to do. Imagine how boring it would be for an actor to have to just be like, happy face, the whole play. <laughs> right? Or, oh, man, this is the crying play. I just am never stop crying and frowning in this play. Um, so think about that. Um, the other version of this is to when we think about out, so that's ups and downs, right? If you have an up, put it down, up, down, up, down. And think about this on acts too. If the act ends on an up, then the next act should probably end on the down. And you can reverse that logic as well. You can, you know, reverse engineer it. If you know where you're going, as we've always talked about, the sooner you can know where your play is going, then you can reverse engineer it to go, well, if it ends with everybody killing themselves at the end, that midpoint should maybe great news. They're home. She loves me. We did it. You know, some version of good disruption so that the bad news of the end of the play can be that much more poignant and we have that much farther to go. We have a journey to go from midpoint to end. Um, and opposite, if we're ending with you know, marriage and a wedding <laughs> um, and a dance party, then maybe that ending, that midpoint has to be, oh no, this is never gonna work. Oh God, she's dead. I don't know if that's a terrible midpoint for a comedy, but anyway, um, go, go with what you want. But think about that, it is balance, it's ups and downs. It's, you know, positive, negative. This is, you know, everything sounds like physics when I talk about it, <laughs> the, the, the high valence um, and the complementarity of your magnetic poles need to be aligned. Um, great. So the other version of this, which was told to me and it blew my mind um, by a, a, an amazing screenwriter who talked about we talk, when we plot outline, it's often plot. <laughs> the outline is usually a series of events that we're going, okay, this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this person does this, which causes this, and then we get to the end. Great, done. Outline accomplished. But his point, which I've literally never stopped thinking about, is there is the parallel emotional outline, which is what is your character feeling? at each point and the outline of how they feel about it, what their opinion is, what is going on in their heart um, can help remind you that this is, this is playable. These characters are full of feeling and knowing and desire and complexity. So it's not just um, the drama of things happening, it's people feeling, it's the drama of people feeling. And we started this whole thing talking about the power of character. Comedy is character, drama is character. Um, the whole point of a play is watching a character test themselves. So we need to know throughout your the outline every scene, what are they feeling? And honestly, if you can't describe what they're feeling, then you need to go investigate what's going on in that scene or make them feel something, amp up that opinion, um, amp up their passion or, you know, whatever. Um, but your character has to feel. So you can outline the whole play and go literally just ask yourself, what is the character feeling about this? Okay, this happens in this scene. What do they feel about it? Then this happens in this scene. Okay, what do they feel about it? What are they coming into that scene with emotionally and what do they leave with emotionally? This helps you really supercharge your characters and make sure that they are invested and um, engaged uh, in every scene. So I love that idea. It's a great exercise, even for later drafts when you're kind of like, is this play really singing? Or, you know, <laughs> are we ready? Um, making sure that every scene has an emotional arc as well as that plot arc, the dominoes of plot falling. The, the tension and release of emotion has to be going to. All right, um, okay, cool. So now we're gonna get a little bit more practical. Um, I will start with a general over, overview of like how plays come to their world premieres because I think a lot of people can get confused about that. Um, and there's just a lot of questions about, I wrote a play, okay, when are we premiering it? And knowing kind of the steps so that you can look out for them, you can seek them out, you can find them and apply for them. Um, so basically, all right. The writing of the play, uh, getting to draft one where you come out of your the hovel of your office <laughs> and emerge bleary eyed with a script first draft um, is honestly, the writing begins at that point. 
don't freak out. <laughs> but I say that to say that it, your play is nowhere near done when it's done. <laughs> that first draft is nowhere near done because all of the truth of what's gonna make this great theater happens when you invite people in to read it, to consult as dramaturgs and directors, to work with artistic teams at theaters to premiere it, and not to mention designers, actors. There's so many steps from when you go, I have a draft um, to that first production. Quickly, I'll go through this. Um, the first step is various versions of readings and workshops that can be at your kitchen table. Mine is always at my kitchen table first. Um, you are uh, then looking and, and series of readings. This, this will be need to read several times and workshops. We call that usually a day or more of time together. Some rehearsal involved, which means you're going to need a director, um, ideally a dramaturg as well. Um, Martine uh, K. Green's discussion about what a dramaturg is and does and why are they are so awesome um, will happen, I think, next week. Look on the Facebook page, uh, the events section, and you'll see all of the classes and interviews. But she that that one will be very important because we'll discuss exactly what a dramaturg does, um, why they're so valuable and how they work with writers, et cetera. Anyway, um, so at a certain point you will involve directors, dramaturgs, obviously actors to do reading, hearing it out loud. Out loud. And after every one of these steps will almost certainly be rewrites. For me, it is constant rewriting. This is what I mean when I say that the draft is, you know, the, the journey is like 10% completed after draft one. It's not 90% completed, it's like 10 because there's so much rewriting, so much rewriting. Instantly, you'll know um, if things are working and great, always ask for questions. If you feel, if you've surrounded yourself with people you feel comfortable with, get their opinions, get their questions. Um, this does not mean take all of their notes. I could do a whole rant on note taking. I think I did on Twitter once, but um, tr trust the notes from people you trust. Uh, and the loudest voice in the room does not mean that their opinion goes in the play and trust that you know this play more than anyone. So no matter who is involved, the writer is the eyes, ears, heart, guts, cerebral system <laughs> of the play. Um, so don't let anyone take over. If someone is taking over or promises, well, if you change this about your script, we'll do a workshop of it or we'll do a premiere of it. F that. If they don't like the script, um, they shouldn't do it. And uh, it's very hard to say no to those things. I know early on in your career, that's when a lot of these mistakes happen where you give over control or you take too many notes and uh, the play becomes not yours anymore. And then at that point, what's the point? What is this? Um, so we can talk about how to navigate that um, and how to find allies um, to make sure that you're making smart decisions. Uh, but it's the trusting that instinct. Part of what you will build as a playwright is the instinct to know which notes to take. Um, whether it works for your play or not, whether you're like, that is a great note for someone else's play, <laughs> or that is a fabulous note, I'm gonna change that right now, or tell me more about that, what do you mean? Um, so yes, uh, you are, you know, the bucks does stop with you, the writer, um, but finding people you trust means that you can really have conversations and figure things out and, and go deep and, and truly collaborate. Uh, but it is fine to go, I trust this person and not this person. I'd like, I can work with this actor, not this actor. This dramaturg totally gets me. We're the same person. We like the same wine. <laughs> uh, we have the same coffee order. Um, uh, and this director, awesome, tried to take over my play, never gonna work with them again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, anyway, okay, so we've done readings, we've done workshops, we've done a crap ton of rewrites. Ideally, there will be um, an offer, whether it comes as a part of something you've submitted to, like a new play festival, something like the O'Neill or the Bay Area Playwrights Festival. Um, if it's something that an artistic director or literary director has reached out to you saying, I'd love to read your play. Um, if you have an agent, it might come from agents. If you don't, totally fine. Um, we'll talk about agents in a second. Uh, um, and then that offer of a world premiere, yay, may come to pass. And what a good day that is and celebrate that day because it will be amazing, but it will also be complicated as anything is. Um, I will tell you that once we are in the room uh, of a new play that first week, I will almost certainly end day four or five or that first week having reprinted the entire play for the team meaning that there are rewrites going on so thoroughly during that first week of production uh, of rehearsal that I am absorbing all of this in real time, absorbing the, the talent and the vision and the offerings of these actors, absorbing just now we're actually making it and the conversations with director and dramaturg. 
Um, so even at that point, when you're like, great, they chose it. This is the play they're going to produce means that I'm still changing it. And the truth is that things can be changed up till opening night. Now the savvy playwright will know that you don't wanna add a new act, even a new scene um, on opening <laughs> because it will terrorize your actors. But tweaks are fine, adjustments are fine, line cuts are fine. Um, at least I work with actors who know that that may be coming, know that that's a reality and know that that's what's best for the play, that we're all working to make the best play, not to make the easiest performance. Um, hopefully those are the same thing. <laughs> they often aren't um, because a new play is a work in progress. You learn everything about this play from that first production. So much so that you're still learning after it's already opened and you can't change things so that that second production is actually after that is when I know, okay, I've learned how this play works. So it actually does take two productions for me. And I know that is a privilege to even say some people don't get one production, much less two. Um, but this is why we need these great things like uh, those rolling world premieres I was talking about, uh, part of the new National New Play Network, that we need um, this sense of supporting a new play on its, on its journey includes several iterations, fully realized iterations, so we can know what we're doing. It is only after that production or two that um, you perhaps will get an offer for publishing. Um, publishing happens after production. So people sometimes think, and I certainly did when I, before I started this, that you kind of do publishing first and the publishing is how you get the plays, the play productions, um, but it is not, it comes after. Um, partly because they wanna publish something that has been tested and, and um, maybe there's a nice review to put on it or such. Um, so think about it in that order. And basically why I'm telling you that is to kind of get a bit of a, a sense of the long game, but also know, know where to put your energy right now. Don't worry about publishing or agents right now. If you are starting on your career or mid-career or whatever, work with finding those literary managers, those artistic directors, those theater companies, those actors, directors, dramaturg that get you, that want to support you in your your relationships and your work at those folks, because those are the gatekeepers, the gatekeepers and the you know huggers um, who who will be the ones to, to, to realize this. Um, I don't know a ton about self-production, so maybe we can have somebody on to talk about that because that is certainly an option and can be amazing. Um, so we can we can talk about those options as well. Um, yeah, I hope that helps. Uh, the conversation about agents is similar to, to the conversation about publishing houses. Um, Shout out to my publishers. Thank you, Dramatists and Play Scripts and Samuel French and all of these amazing people um, who are offering a ton of free content right now if you want to read some of their plays. Um, it's a great, it's a great thing. So um, anyway, um, agents. Agents will come to you. That's the short version. They'll come to you. You don't need to reach out to them. If you end up in a great new play festival, if you win an award, if you have a, a, a production, um, I think it's fine to let them know, but they probably already know because they're good at their jobs and they're surveying the theater landscape. Um, that's how it's happened to me and most of my friends who've gotten agents. Um, you can also, don't, you don't have to have them. I know several people who've gotten major productions at huge theaters with no agent in sight. Um, so that is certainly possible. And it, it requires that same kind of diligence um, and tenacity, uh, finding your people. It's all about finding your people, the people that believe in you, that you believe in, that you trust. Um, and that will, may include an agent, it may not. Um, but eventually with enough productions and stuff, the agents will, will come. And they are great um, when you can have them. Um, but even still, I will say, I adore my agents so much and my managers as well, but there is still a lot of just personal connection that happens to get plays on stages and to start new relationships with theaters. It's still a lot of me. Um, my agents do a ton of work and I'm so grateful, but it's still about people being people to each other. Um, so you can do that without an agent um, and I encourage you to do so. Um, but all of that starts with finding the theaters that do the work you love and respond to looking at the work they're doing, who's working at those theaters, what directors and actors and dramaturgs are working there, and starting relationships with them in any way that you can. Follow them on Twitter for starters, you know, um, see their work. If they're local to you, reach out and say, I, I loved that show that you did. Um, um, I'd be happy to take you out to coffee. I'd love to hear more about it, but I know that you're busy. I just wanted to say I love your work. You know, that stuff is valuable and great and real and I think it is meaningful to a lot of people. Can everyone that you reach out to have a cup of coffee with you? Probably not, because we're all busy and we're all quarantined right now anyway, but um, but some people might, and that's how relationships begin. Um, yeah. Okay, 
So that's a little bit of the business. I covered some of it. Um, if there's any other questions about business things, um, put them in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, I guess we didn't talk about commissions. That, that can happen, again, with relationships. Um, the commissions that I got were based on relationships I had formed long before that, that happened. Um, some commissions come out of the blue, but again, that usually happens once you have some career um, to, to point to and plays that people can read and see and go, oh yeah, now that's exactly who, that's kind of the theater I wanna do or put more out in the world. Um, and you can also uh, pitch. I, I will have to have on a couple of the people directing, um, the directors who are coming to speak with us and their interviews can have some insight on that because I actually don't know what it's like to decide which commissions to give and, and such. So we'll, we'll ask some people about that because um, that would be good information for all of us. All right, um, a little bit, a few, a few more things. Um, I would like to put this out there again. I don't have answers for this, but I do want to bring it to your attention that this is a time where thankfully we um, uh, can ask ourselves who's in charge of storytelling. And uh, what I mean by that is to bring up the question about, should I write this play? As a white woman, um, there are plays that I'm going to say I shouldn't write. I should pass the mic. I should support somebody else whose story that more aligns with. Um, and I am happy to do that. And I think all of us should be. This is in the same vein, like so many of us are able to now acknowledge our privilege and to shut up instead of talk, <laughs> um, says the woman broadcasting long monologues on Facebook all the time. Um, but uh, it is a good thing to ask yourself. Uh, oftentimes in playwriting classes, I have come to learn about plays that people are writing and, it's about a civil rights struggle and it's written by a straight white man. <laughs> and you go, mm, not saying you can't write or shouldn't. And you know, art is art, write what you wanna write. But know that when you're finding a team to choose to produce this, um, they might ask those questions. Why are you writing this? What, what uh, uh, you know, soulful authenticity are you adding to this? Is this just a great story that you kind of saw and are putting on stage in writing? Um, now, if your play has parts of it that do not come from your personal experience, it doesn't mean you can't write it. It means that you should reach out to those communities early to do your, do your diligence, talk to them. Um, and frankly, this is a good sign. If you don't know anyone in those communities to reach out to and talk to, maybe that's a sign you should be writing this play. <laughs> um, but uh, I will use, again, one of my plays as an example, when we were writing Peter Pan um, for Shakespeare Theater Company, of course, the first thing I wanted to do is reimagine the role of Tiger Lily um, as a more authentic um, uh, Indigenous American experience, imbue her with agency and not all of the horrendous stereotypes that um, she comes with in other versions of that play. But I know that I can't do that by myself. So. Um, First, we insi I insisted, and of course, Shakespeare Theater already was on, on board with this about casting uh, an Indigenous American actor. Um, but I also know that it is not the actor's job necessarily to speak from a cultural place um, while they are also trying to do their job of being a great actor. So you don't want to just have the actor in the room being responsible because partly the imbalance of power is is obvious there. Um, if it's only the actors that are representing um, a part of the story that writer or director don't represent, that imbalance is, is off. So this is where cultural consultants can come in. I was very lucky to have um, two uh, indigenous, indigenous American, Native American um, consultants and they read the script and were very honest about things. And I said, thank you for your honesty. And they said, are you sure? Because there's a couple of things that you don't have to take these notes. And I'm like, no, the whole point is to take the notes because you know the things that I don't know. Um, and there's a, there is certainly a version of Peter Pan that will be written by an indigenous writer and I cannot wait for that version. I will be the first in line, um, but because this play um, was, had the team built in this way, I wanted to make sure to have that. So that is possible for you. And I would say, first off, pay these people. <laughs> um, you don't just get to kind of take their, their wisdom as a favor pay them, give them uh, the time they need to, 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 to think and, and really talk to you. And if you're going to engage with a cultural consultant, listen to them. If you want somebody to just tell you you're doing a great job and you're totally right and super woke, then that's not what a cultural consultant is. You need to listen to them. So find somebody that you trust and can work with you. 
So putting, putting them out there in general, again, I don't have a ton of advice or specific rules um, because I'm learning as well, but I, the only thing I do know is to open the room and invite people in. And if you really do care about telling um, stories about communities of which you are not a part, but of which you obviously care because you're writing about them or want to write about them, open the doors, let these, let them in, talk, listen, mostly, maybe not talk. I should put that at the end of the list. Listen, listen, listen. Um, and they will be amazing plays that you shouldn't be the person to write. And that is fine and awesome because that opens the door for some, a voice that we desperately need. So um, take of that what you will. I'm sure this will provoke a lot of conversation and I'm happy to engage in that because um, I think it's very important. All right, we've talked about a lot of things. Huh, huh, directors, actors, oh my gosh, so much going on. Revisions, I talked about that. Business of writing, I talked a ton about that. Yeah, what's left? I guess what's left is talking about what's coming next. Y'all, we made such a thing. This has been like a month of things that we made at this strange ass time. And I am incredibly grateful and <laughs> so proud of all of you and the questions you've you've sent to me. Um, and I will say some of these questions and comments that I've gotten have really changed the way I think about teaching writing, writing myself, how theater works and should work, which is part of why this series of interviews and conversations has become really important. Um, we're going to have a bunch upcoming. I've mentioned a few. So uh, the next two Wednesdays, we'll do our book club, like I mentioned, same time, same place. Um, this Friday, we have our musical theater class with Kate Kerrigan and Brian Loudermilk. They are amazing. They will tell you the inside scoop of how at least we write, how they write. Um, we've written about theater for young audience, we've written theater for young audiences as well as main stage, so we can talk about both. Um, but bring your questions, learn about how the musicals are made. Uh, they are so smart. And again, an encyclopedic knowledge of musical theaters that they reference at the drop of the hat. So I'm very excited to share that conversation with you. I think you can learn a ton for those interested in musicals. Um, we have, uh, as I mentioned, Evan Ajikin, who will talk about directing new plays, that director-playwright relationship. We have Martine K. Green, who's going to talk about dramaturg and playwright relationships. Um, we have a bunch of stuff upcoming. Deep Tran is going to talk about theater journalists and theater critics' relationships with playwrights and the kind of landscape of that. I have a couple of new um, people that um, have just agreed or are starting to agree uh, Regina Victor and Eric Ting, um, uh, and a bunch of others. So we're going to just kind of fill the space with these conversations. If there's something um, that you would really like to hear about, um, I can reach into my email <laughs> and see if we can um, get an interview. Um, people have been incredibly generous with their time and wisdom, um, and I hope that you're as grateful for that as I am. And uh, yeah. Thanks again for spending this hour uh, talking about theater in a time when theater is hard to make and hard to support. But I think the way we make theater and support theater now is to make it and support it. So for all of you in virtual rehearsals in sharing your monologues and your songs, thank you um, for you, those of you getting subscriptions to theaters now sending them a few bucks. Um, it makes a world of difference. For those of you who know artists who are affected by this, who have lost their jobs, been furloughed, lost productions, um, reach out to them and say thank you. And I don't know, Venmo them a couple bucks for, for a, a, I don't know, a delivery of some noodles or something. Um, yeah, I have been incredibly inspired by the online social media presence of people. I know it does not replace a real hug and a real high five and real work in the room, nor should it, but it is a thing. It's a big thing. And I think it's a beautiful thing. So thank you for all that you're doing to put out in the world and reaching out. And um, I'll see you in many other forms, in many other Facebook lives and, uh, yeah. All right. I'm thinking of all of you. Thank you. And 